Good morning, Wrecking Yard Church. Always, not always, but oftentimes we have some warfare uh, that takes place one way or another. So again, I covet and appreciate your prayers. Again, good morning, Wrecking Yard Church, wherever this presentation finds you. We have men and women, young and old, from Pennsylvania, Glendale, California. Good morning, wake up there. Reno, Nevada. We have Eastern, Western Washington, Tigard, Oregon, Pocatello, Idaho, Honolulu, Hawaii. Eric, good day to you. Um, and a host of others, but I just want to uh, send my love and Tina's love to you. How we miss each and every single one of you again, wherever today finds you. This is, uh, you might be looking at my black eye and eight stitches on my face. Uh, the cosmetic uh, company L'Oreal has canceled my contract because <laughs> Tina hit me with a frying pan. No, she didn't really. Uh, we've been married 38 years. We have four wonderful girls, three grandchildren, and um, I've had an accident uh, uh, that uh, caused this uh, um, scar on my face and black eye, and so uh, all of that to say we are in uh, the healing uh, pattern now. So uh, all of that to say again, good morning to you. I'm going to have Tina put a picture up on the screen of a wrecking yard and when you see uh, that wrecking yard there that's the name of this uh, itinerant ministry um, and it is uh, uh, basically what we're uh, calling after is men and women like yourselves that have been truly wrecked for Jesus Christ wrecked in a spiritual way uh, where there's been such an encounter of the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ that you will never ever be the same. Uh, that there has truly been a, a transformation uh, taking place from the inside out and you could never ever go back to a life, uh, uh, to a, uh, a system uh, that you have been brought out of. And also it is a wrecking yard because life can bring many collisions to you and I in this journey. And I want to encourage you that regardless of what's happened in your life and the collisions that have taken place, God is able to restore uh, and to renew each and every single one of our lives. So I want you to be encouraged, again, that no matter what has happened to you, the Lord is able to restore all that the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust and the caterpillar has eaten from your life. We are today currently in a suburb of Houston called Sugar Land, uh, Texas. We were actually scheduled um, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, uh, to go to uh, Mexico and Central America, primarily uh, Honduras and Nicaragua. And, uh, but the Hurricane Agatha uh, came into actually the region where we uh, have a base camp uh, and uh, uh, created tremendous damage on the Pacific side of the state that we have a base camp in Mexico called Oaxaca. Oaxaca, uh, if you were going south, is uh, uh, one Mexican state away from Central America. You would go from Oaxaca to Chiapas, Chiapas to Belize, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador. Uh, you would have Honduras, Nicaragua. You would then have uh, uh, Costa Rica and Panama, and then you would head uh, up, as it were, or down, uh, depending on, uh, again, which uh, direction you're in. You would then hit Bogota, Colombia, and then you would continue on to hit Ecuador and uh, Peru, etc., etc. All of that to say is tremendous damage occurred in our base camp. I think Tina is going to put up a couple of pictures so you can see what Hurricane Agatha did. Uh, and there is severe damage with the villages, um, and one in particular, again, where our, 
our home is. Um, it had taken much damage. Our home uh, fared better than most. It blew out windows and uh, lots of rain and debris and wind uh, uh, came in and, and hit uh, uh, bed, uh, beds and furniture, etc. And so we are trying to uh, figure out how to uh, bring some repairing to that area. Uh, also, uh, if, uh, if you're able, anything you're able to do to help in the process of this cleanup, not only for ourselves, but many of the leaders uh, have lost homes. As you can see, most of them are built out of uh, sticks and pieces of wood and pieces of tin, etc., and they got destroyed in this uh, in this hurricane. So covet your prayers for them. And again, any help you can give to the ministry uh, would be of tremendous appreciation. We from here in a couple of weeks will head up to the northwest. We have uh, already meetings scheduled in uh, the northwest area as well as in Canada. Uh, and We will be up there for around five to six weeks and then uh, we will uh, move again from there as well. Uh, we appreciate all of your emails, your texts, uh, your communications, your notes, and your letters. Many of you, again, so appreciative of God's Word and the uh, dynamics of uh, forgiveness and a host of things that you have shared. And again, Tina and I pray almost daily for each of you uh, as we run through the list of people in the three churches we have planted and those of you that we have gotten to know online, we send our love to you. Now, today what we're going to do is we'll have a, a song and, uh, and worship some, then we will come back and teach uh, on a message if um, under enemy attack and what you should do if you're under an enemy attack, what you should do. And if we have time, uh, beloved, we will take communion together. Now, I can't guarantee we will get to that today, but during the worship time, if you are able uh, to go and to uh, grab uh, uh, some, um, some um, you know, drink uh, of, uh, of um, uh, wine or a substitute therein and some uh, bread, uh, symbols of uh, the, bre uh, the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, then if we do have worship or do have communion, we will uh, be ready to go. So let's pray and then we will have some worship. We'll come back and uh, we will have a teaching under enemy attack what to do. I think it's a, a pivotal message in respect to what's happening in our nation and in some nations today and within your lives as well. So let's pray. Lord, again, we thank you that we can uh, gather uh, from near and afar underneath the banner of Jesus Christ and your holy word. Uh, we would pray, O oh God, as um, we uh, begin to worship you, not only uh, with our lives, but within song, uh, that you would bring us from the outer court uh, and the holy place into the holy of holies, uh, whereby you would receive all of your due honor and love and uh, a, an incense and, and a perfume and fragrance of the uh, love and adoration of your people. I thank you again for each one watching and listening today and those that will. I command blessing over them in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, beloved, I'll see you in just a little bit.
your love made a way.
hear the Lord say, you do, you do, you do. Hear the Lord say, it's you, it's you that moves me. When you begin to sing, when you begin to be, it's you that moves me. You without the talent, you without the performance. Yes, Lord. Just love worshiping Him and surrendering over and over and over to Him for... Beloved, He's worthy of your life, worthy of your heart, worthy of everything you and I have uh, desire to give to Him. If you have your Bible, um, if you would uh, stand, those of you that are able, we have three readings this morning. The first one is taken from Second Chronicles chapter 31, verse 20 and 21. Second Chronicles Verses, chapter 31, verses 20 through 21. Second Chronicles, chapter 31, verses 20 through 21. While you're turning, I want to just give a shout out to a wonderful prophet in the beautiful state of Mexico. Uh, prophet Harmon, good morning to you, dear one. Blessings to you. Second Chronicles chapter 31 verses 20 through 21. I'll give you a moment to find it. Angel, I'm waiting on you. I hope you have your Bible tabs and you're opening that up. <laughs> the Bible says here that King Hezekiah did this throughout Judah. And he did what was noticed, beloved. He did what was good what was right and true before the Lord his God. And every work which he began in the service of the house of God in the law and in the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all of his heart and prospered. This was King Hezekiah. The second scripture I want you to find, it's um, right uh, next to it, chapter 32, verses 1 through 2. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verses 1 through 2. After all that King Hezekiah had so faithfully done, Sennacherib, king of Assyria. Now, Sennacherib isn't a new menu item for McDonald's. Okay, Sennacherib. Uh, he literally was a wicked king from a world power named Assyria. King Sennacherib of Assyria came and invaded Judah, which is, in, which is Jerusalem. He laid siege to the fortified cities, thinking to conquer them for himself. Another translation says that after King Hezekiah had faithfully carried out his, this work, King Sennacherib, the enemy of Assyria, invaded Judah. He laid siege to the fortified towns, giving orders for his army to break through their walls. King Hezekiah, a godly king, one of the most godliest kings in all of Judah and even within your Bible, faced the enemy and faced warfare and faced attack. And lastly, 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 through 11. 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 through 11. I'm reading out of the King James Version. 2 Chronicles chapter 29, 1 through 11. The Bible says, And Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old, and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abiah, and the daughter of Zechariah. Verse 2, And he, King, uh, Hezekiah, did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father had done. Verse 3, And in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together in the east street. Verse 5, And he said unto them, Hear me, you Levites, you priests. 
Sanctify yourselves now and sanctify or consecrate the house of the Lord your God of your fathers and carry forth all of the filthiness out of the holy place. Verse 6, For our fathers had trespassed and did that which was evil in the eyes of the Lord our God. They forsook him and turned away their faces from the habitation of God himself and turned their backs. Verse 7, they also shut the doors of the porch to the, of the altar and they put out uh, the lamps and they did not burn incense nor offered burnt offerings in the holy place uh, unto the God of Israel. Verse 8. Wherefore the wrath of the Lord was upon Judah and Jerusalem, and he had delivered them to trouble, to the astonishment, and to the hissing, as you see with your eyes. For lo, our fathers have fallen by the sword, our sons and daughters, our wives uh, are in captivity for this. Verse 10, now it is in, King Hezekiah said, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his fierce wrath may turn away from us. My sons, be not now negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him, to serve him, and that you should minister unto him and burn incense. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I lift up um, this nation and the nations, but primarily this nation this morning. And as we see a continuum and an increase of attacks within our nation, uh, Lord, in the waxing of evil, uh, more and more prophesied by your servants, we, uh, Lord, would ask that your holy word would penetrate into our lives today, uh, that there would be choices and decisions that uh, we would uh, desire to stand in the gap and to pray. Uh, God, may uh, you raise up uh, a people uh, that will see the necessity uh, to stand in a gap and uh, to pray unto you uh, that you would quell the work of the enemy and that today you would teach us uh, that when we personally are under attack, uh, that you would teach us what to do through your holy word. Uh, I lift up our time together and uh, pray, uh, Lord, that you would bypass uh, again a weak and a feeble man. Uh, a man that's incapable of uh, even speaking your holy oracles and by your grace and mercy uh, you uh, and your word would touch each of us today uh, that you would be given all glory and there would be change that would take place within our lives, our families and our nations in the name of Jesus Christ. I thank you again for the blessed opportunity. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Are you under enemy attack? What should you do? Beloved, as I uh, mentioned in a prayer, and as you already know, within our nation, we continue to see an increase of uh, demonic attack uh, moving through the lives of men and women, uh, succumbing to uh, the uh, works of hell itself. Uh, we see within nations uh, the continuum, and as prophesied uh, through uh, God's servants, uh, in the last days there will be terrible times and, and the waxing of evil will increase and yet God uh, has declared through the prophet Isaiah that when the world is in, in its most darkest place there shall come a great and a mighty uh, light uh, and that is uh, you, his church, uh, in this hour and in this day. And if you find yourself under enemy attack, and at some point you will if you are truly a Christian, whether you will be attacked in your emotions and your feelings, uh, family members, uh, your children, uh, possibly a wife or a husband under attack and, and, and one another, your health, uh, your employer, or employees, a host of places, loneliness, uh, depression, hopelessness, finance, job losses, Possibly you're feeling detached from God's plan 
Possibly you feel cooled in your uh, spirit and distant from God. Um, beloved, I believe that um, uh, what we uh, will find in uh, this uh, short series under attack, what to do will bring uh, tremendous help to you and I uh, uh, in, our, in our movements upon the world we live in today. My hope uh, today is fivefold. One, uh, I, I want to, uh, to, to declare to you why God is invested in the Old Testament and why you should be too. I want to declare to you why God is invested in the Old Testament, uh, uh, new as well, but Old Testament, and why you should be invested as well. I want to share with you today just two prerequisites for spiritual warfare. You and I are involved in spiritual warfare, whether you believe it or not. The Bible is replete, declaring there is a warfare taking place within the heavenly realms uh, that you and I are in. I want to share and ask you, are you a victim or are you a victor? Are you a victim or are you a victor? You have a choice in it. I also want to ask you, what is your uh, life verse or a life summary? Do you have a life verse that actually continues to motivate you uh, in respect uh, to your life and your day-to-day -day living here on planet Earth? And also, uh, two uh, quick steps of just how to study your Bible. And, and then we will move and build in respect to what to do when you're under attack. Now, let's uh, be thankful that God has left us His Holy Bible. Uh, the initials B-I-B-L-E, a biblical instruction before leaving earth. God has left us this and it's been born on the uh, uh, blood of, of martyrs and of saints of days gone by and even today. There are 66 books in this Bible written over a span of centuries even between them. Over uh, 40 different authors ranging from herdsmen to kings. And yet there is a divine uh, scarlet thread running all the way from Genesis to Revelation uh, that God has given us. The Bible says that this holy word Old Testament and New has been God-breathed, uh, that He has put His living Spirit in it, unlike any other book upon the world that you and I live in, that you can read other uh, authors and other uh, um, books by famous Christian people which are good, but this holy book has been inspired and God breathed that every time you read it and listen to it, there is God himself ushering uh, his spirit into your mind, into your life. And it's imperative that we give God thanks and realize the importance of this holy word within your, within your life and mine. We are going to look at this king uh, by the name of Hezekiah, a king that uh, literally lived uh, over 3,000 years ago and was under siege and under an attack from an Assyrian uh, world power uh, by a king named Sennacherib. Sennacherib, his name in the Hebrew literally means sins that infected and poisoned other people. That's what his name means in the Hebrew. He was the king of a world power the size of Russia and China combined that was moving across the nations and, uh, and, and, and overpowering them. And he came to Jerusalem, known as Judah, and that was next upon his plan to conquer Again, his name in the Hebrew means sins that begin to infect and poison other people. It's important for you and I to realize that not only does Satan want to poison you and I, but also for you and I to poison other people through our own wayward choices and actions. And so I pray for me and you, beloved, that there would be such an awareness that the Bible says no man and no woman lives or dies to themselves. Your actions, your choices, and mine actually have a capacity to influence towards God or away from Him in our day-to-day -day living. Now, some are possibly 
thinking to themselves, again, what can a king 3,000 years ago help me today in 2022 when I am under attack? And uh, what good does that have for me? I want to underline the fact that God is invested in the Old Testament as well. And you should be. I mentioned a number of uh, years ago, a ministry, a large ministry in Atlanta, Georgia. A man has a congregation of 38,000 people. And I quote, uh, he declared to his people and those that listened to him that the Old Testament is of no value to the New Testament Christian. And he uh, uh, told his congregation to quit looking at the Old Testament, that we are New Testament Christians and New Testament saints, and the Old Testament has no value. Now, you, beloved, should have one or two proof scriptures uh, to resist what he just taught uh, and to begin to bring a, a value to what God values. I'm just going to give you a few scriptures so that you are able to support uh, the understanding of the Old Testament and this Holy Bible, new and old. The Bible says in Romans 15:4, I want you to have these in your heart and spirit. And it says, Paul, for whatever and whatsoever things that were written in the Old Testament aforetime were written for our learning and through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Did you hear what Paul declared in the New Testament? Whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written in the past, was written for our instruction. So that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Paul is pulling in the validity and the understanding value of the Old Testament for your life and mine. That it brings instruction, it brings knowledge, it brings encouragement. And it does have great value in your life. The old adage, the Old Testament concealed is the New Testament revealed. And the New Testament revealed is the Old Testament concealed. Paul said in 1 Corinthians uh, um, uh, 14, I believe, he said, first the natural and then the spiritual. First the natural and then the spiritual. And that means that when we read of the natural dynamics in the Old Testament, there is a spiritual counterpart within the New Testament as well. I'm underlining the investment of the Old Testament that God has put His Spirit and life in it, and you and I should be invested in it as well. 2 Timothy 3.16, watch. Paul said, all Scripture, Old Testament and New, all Scripture is God-breathed. God is a spirit. He breathed his life, Ruach, into the Old Testament and New Testament. All scripture is God breathed, profitable for teaching, profitable for in, uh, reproof, which means uh, 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 proving that which is correct. It's profitable for correction, proving that which is wrong. For instruction in righteousness so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. Again, God is invested in the Old Testament and I want you to be able to push back with proof scriptures of that in case you have someone that stands before you and tells you that the Old Testament has no value. All scripture is God breathed, profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness. So that the man or woman of a God may be thoroughly equipped to do every good work. 1 Corinthians 10, 11. Paul said, now these things happen to them in the Old Testament as examples, as types. Tupos, is the actual Greek word. Types were written for our admonition to whom the ends of the ages has arrived. What is he saying? He's saying these things happened in the natural, truly historical events, Old Testament. They were examples. They were types for you and I. They were shadows for you and I to learn by. And then lastly, 2 Peter 1, verses 21. The Old Testament, as well as New, the Bible declares, was not written by the will of man. Some people will say, oh, the Bible was just written by men. Yes, it was written by men, but it was God who wrote through the men. 
Did you hear what I said? So when they say, yeah, it was written by a bunch of men. Yes, it was written by men, but it was not written by the will of men, but it was God. Oh, here's the scripture. For God's word and prophecy of God's word had its or, uh, uh, never had its origin in the will of man. But prophets, watch, through, uh, though human, spoke from God and wrote from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God and wrote from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That, that uh, phrase carried along in the Greek literally means the highest level of rapids uh, that you and I know of, which I believe is a level six, um, meaning that there is uh, no, you're not even able to control the movement of that, uh, of that river. It's moving so fast. What does that mean? That when men wrote 66 books of this Bible, it wasn't by the will of a man. It was by God's Holy Spirit energizing uh, that man in such a way, in such power. When they wrote, they didn't even know many what they were writing, and they were writing so fast. Ezekiel said, I don't even know what I'm writing, nor do I understand. It was coming out that fast. Now, on the contrary, beloved, I have seen demonic writing, and uh, it is similar that uh, uh, the uh, demonic entities are so uh, strong in an individual, they begin, it's called in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in this realm, automatic writing. And I have seen two individuals uh, that were empowered by demonic entities, and they wrote with such speed uh, and with such uh, 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 movement it was it was amazing to watch one of them took out a crystal and began to interpret what was being written uh, from that uh, movements of writing that uh, demon entities had fed him Conversely, your holy Bible, it is inspired, it is inerrant without error. And God himself moved on man and wrote that 66 books again through the difference of uh, centuries from herdsmen to kings. You and I can be trusted and we have a foundation that the Bible says that this word will live forever and ever and ever. Heavens and earth will uh, scroll away, but this word will live forever and ever and ever, and that God elevates it even above his own name. Okay. Now, a side note in terms of you and I, to study your Bible, two quick points while we are in the neighborhood. One is how to study just two quick points. There's many points, but one is to actually set aside time to read your Bible. To actually set aside time to read the Bible. I mentioned the Barley Saints, the saints that I am discipling and taking them through manuals, 16 manuals that we have developed, uh, endeavoring to implant in them a culture of their life and to carve out some time just to read the Bible. If I were able to line us all up, I would want to ask Tell me when that time is that is non-negotiable. I know the busyness of life uh, and challenge and responsibility is heavy, but I do trust God either listening to it on the way to work or coming back or something. God will open up even a small little portion of time to begin to cultivate this culture within you. And then number two, don't read your Bible quickly. Don't read it quickly. Um, one, uh, one gentleman, uh, uh, an aged uh, minister uh, who had passed away years ago, I remember what he wrote. He said something like this. He said, I study my Bible uh, as I gather apples. First, I shake the whole tree uh, that the ripest uh, fruit might fall. Then I shake each limb. And when I have shaken each limb, I shake each branch and every twig. And then I look under every leaf. 
I search the Bible as a whole, like shaking the whole tree. Then I shake every limb. I study book after book. I shake every branch, giving attention to the chapters when they do not uh, 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 break the sense of what I'm reading. Then I shake every twig. I carefully study the paragraphs, sentences, and words and their meanings. Another author said, I read uh, each chapter, I go back, and I read each word, and I ponder, and I meditate, meaning I chew on them slowly. Two small principles just to study. Now, as we uh, move here now, uh, I want to begin to uh, uh, bring a prerequisite for spiritual warfare. So before we uh, undertake uh, and, and see uh, how King Hezekiah defeated uh, Sennacherib, the uh, world power of Assyria overwhelmed uh, numerically and a host of issues, two prerequisites to spiritual warfare. You and I read them in our opening time. And it was uh, this here, Hezekiah, 2 Chronicles 31, 20 through 20. 21. Now listen real careful, beloved. Prerequisites to spiritual warfare. Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, did this throughout Judah, and he did what was watched now, good and right and true before the Lord his God. And every work which he began in the service of the house of God in the law and in the commandment seeking his God, he did with all of his heart and prospered. This beloved was a, um, a life summary of King Hezekiah, one of the most godliest kings that God himself raised up and honored uh, and honors today. This is a life summary of King Hezekiah, and my prayer for me is that if I could even have a portion of that as a life summary that God would look and declare that, there, that this one did this which was good and right and, and everything before his God and, and the service and seeking and, 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 and his heart. Uh, this was a beautiful uh, life summary. Now let me ask you, what is your life verse? What is your life summary? Now, some of you can feel like, well, I've really blown it. I don't have one. You can change the narrative of your life summary right now. You can develop in God a new life summary from your past, from uh, your current situation. And you, like Hezekiah, as you will see, uh, that's what happened in his life. Uh, he began to change the narrative and, and to change how the tree was bent and God used him mightily. I encourage you to have a life verse, to have a life summary that is within your Bible that you can uh, continue to, uh, to meditate upon in uh, your life. Now notice what happened, beloved. Key, key point, the very next two verses... You and I have a new chapter, uh, 2 Chronicles 32, 1 through 2, which we read together. But in your Old Testament and New, there is no chapter breaks. There is even no verse numbers. Those were something uh, translators have put in to make it more helpful for you and I. But in the original Old Testament and New Testament, there, there are no chapters in the original Hebrew and Greek. There are no uh, verse numbers. So reading this without it, you can see where now Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, has this beautiful life summary that God put in this Holy Bible. And then the next two verses, watch carefully, pre requisites for spiritual warfare and it says this after Hezekiah had faithfully carried out this work King Sennacherib the enemy of Israel invaded and attacked Jerusalem and Judah he laid siege to the fortified cities giving orders for his army to break through their walls prerequisite to spiritual warfare, beloved, is that right after this testimony and summary of King Hezekiah, so pleasing to God and so honored as a king, that now, next, what took place, the enemy attacked him. Listen carefully. It wasn't because of an act of rebellion within Hezekiah's life. 
wasn't because of disobedience in his life, wasn't because of sins in his life. After Hezekiah was so faithful uh, to God, the enemy came and attacked him. And maybe you're watching or listening today and you're wondering why there is such attack in your marriage. It isn't because necessarily, probably, if you're listening to this ministry, because of disobedience. It isn't because of sins in your life. It isn't uh, because of acts uh, uh, of, uh, of falling away. It is because, like King Hezekiah, he came under enemy attack because of all of the powerful movements of adoration, love, and honor, and, uh, and his life <clears throat> unto God himself, that the enemy will let men and women have church and let them have their kumbaya meetings. But when a man or a woman begins to actually move in this kind of a life summary, then that begins to wreak havoc to the kingdom of darkness. And now there is going to come uh, attacks from the enemy. It is a understanding, a biblical understanding of spiritual warfare. That because you're under attack, again, doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. Probably you're doing a lot of things right. And because of that, here has come this attack. King Hezekiah, can you imagine, beloved, the mentality uh, of what he was having to think through in terms of God? Why are you allowing this to happen? How come I am doing this? I'm giving to God. I'm serving. I'm, I'm following your, uh, your disciplines. I'm endeavoring to be upright before you. I'm endeavoring to live before you. And now there is warfare at his company. One man uh, sent me a number of uh, uh, emails declaring such warfare happening within his company that uh, he declared that uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, employer uh, was coming against him and his wife and trying to uh, get them to quit and a host of things happening. And uh, these are some of the areas that you and I need to have a biblical understanding that warfare, listen to me, is going to be part of this life you and I are living in until we go to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I need to know what to do when you're under attack but first realize that it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong in your life the second thing I want you and I to realize beloved in terms of a prerequisite is 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 this that when God was bringing Israel out of Egypt such an emancipation of slavery under the Egyptian tyranny, and when God was bringing them out through uh, Ramesses and through the Red Sea, this is what he said to them. It's found here in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 13, verses 17 and 18. Exodus chapter 13, verses 17 through 18. Here's what God said. Now it came about when Pharaoh had let the people go, listen, that God did not lead them by the way of the land of the Philistines, even though, watch, it was shorter. God said, lest the people change their minds, watch, when they see war, and they will return back to Egypt. Hence God led the people around the long way, of the way of the wilderness. God said, I will not take them the shorter route, for when they see war and the enemies, they will return to Egypt. Hence, God led the people the longer way through the way of the wilderness. Now, God is a responsible father, and he knew the spiritual condition of the uh, emancipation and the freedom of Israel. He understood that they were farmers, they were herdsmen, they were slaves. They were, if you allow me, they were babies in Christ. And they were not able to a war, a good warfare in the heavenly realm and against their enemy. Against their enemy. And so being a, a loving father, he said, I'm not going to take them the route of, of the Philistines. They will encounter warfare and they will return back to Egypt which is a symbol of the world now we jump ahead when they're now in the promised land second prerequisite they're in the promised land 
Judges chapter 3, 1 through 3. Judges chapter 3, 1 through 3. Now these are the nations that the Lord left to test, listen, beloved, left to test Israel by them, that is all who had not experienced any wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the son of Israel might be taught war. For these had not experienced any war before then, and God left these nations, these enemies, in the promised land. So now we see here that these uh, 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 emancipated Israelites, slaves, that were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, yet babies in Christ, God, being a responsible father, did not take them the shortcut because of warfare, took them the long way around. Now, uh, decades later, we find that they are in uh, the promised land, and God declares to them, Now, you have uh, learned of my ways uh, for 40 years in the wilderness, and I have left, I have left enemies in the land. Why? To teach you how to war. Now, if you are a Christian and you say, I don't want to get involved in warfare, and you have your bridal wedding gown on, God is declaring you better put some war boots on and a bazooka in your bridal dress because he's called you to be a warring bride. There's something within God's heart. He is the Lord Sabaoth. He is the, he is the uh, uh, captain of the host of the armies. God is a warrior in respect to some of who he is. And he wants you and I to learn how to war. To learn how to fight for your marriage. Fight for your family. Fight for your child. Fight for what is your promised land. And he wants to instruct you when I under attack, Hezekiah, this is what you need to do. There is a time within your life and mine when God will recognize where you and I live and you won't encounter much warfare. But there will come a time he will place a demand on you where you have nothing else but to roll your sleeves up and to learn how to fight a war in heavenly places. I remember homeschooling my four daughters, uh, one of them all the way through uh, college and the other three mostly all of their lives as well. And I would endeavor to teach them some math problems. Now, each time they would all come into a challenge of that math problem, I would help them out. But there came a time where I wouldn't help them anymore. They understood the principles. They needed to go to war on that math problem problem and so we need to realize that we don't enable someone or even ourselves but that we actually learn how to war a good warfare again with those four girls each of them learned how to ride a bike but when we took the training wheels off I remember running and holding on to that uh, seat that each of them were on and eventually I let go and they were able to learn how to ride that bicycle, you and I, Christian, wherever, in whatever stage you and I are in, warfare is going to be needful for you and I. Training in warfare and how to war is going to be critical for success in every single area of your life. Listen to this. The Bible says in 1 John 2, 12 through 14, John, uh, the one who uh, uh, leaned on the breast of Jesus, here's what he said, listen to me. He said, I write to you little children because your sins have been forgiven and you know the Father. He goes on, he's talking about three spiritual levels of maturation. I write first. John chapter 2, 12 through 14. I write unto you young men, listen please. He said, young men. A spiritual maturation has happened from children. He said, I write unto you, for the word of God abides in you greatly. Watch. And you have become strong, and you have overcome the enemy. 
One of the signs of spiritual maturation is that you and I have learned to engage the enemy of your soul in every area of your life and listen, and you overcome the enemy. Sometime the pastor isn't going to pick the phone up and pray with you. Sometime your friend isn't going to be there and it's going to be you and it's going to be God and His Word and Holy Spirit and you will have to roll your sleeves up up in the power of Jesus Christ and to defeat and overcome every single enemy in your life. You're going to have to overcome poverty in your life. You're going to have to overcome, as you will see, a victim mentality. You're going to have to overcome the harassments of employees and employers. You're going to have to overcome areas where you feel distant in God and listless and lazy. You're going to have to overcome that through the power of of God's Word and through the Lord Jesus Christ. There will come a time where you, uh, God will take you around a problem like He did Israel, but there will come a time where uh, you'll have to face your enemies. An, uh, an aged uh, mentor who has passed away of mine, Leonard Ravenhill, his son David is one of my spiritual fathers and mentors, but his father Leonard Ravenhill he said one time, and I wrote it down in one of his uh, times with him and, and meeting, he said, wow, scared me. Are you done out there? We haven't started yet. Okay, he said this. If there, listen now, talking about spiritual warfare, a time where you'll have to face the enemy and not being enabled. He said, if there had been a soup kitchen at the prodigal's pig pen, he probably would have never returned to the father's house. Did you hear that? The Bible says that that prodigal was in the pig's pen and he came to his senses because life had dealt him some serious challenges and he came to his senses and Leonard Ravenhill said in terms of enabling and not understanding spiritual warfare, he said if there had been a soup kitchen at the prodigal's pig pen, he probably never would have returned to the Father's house. What is he saying? He's saying there is a time you and I need to learn how to do a warfare in spiritual places and defeat the enemy of our souls in every single area. I refuse to allow one of my daughters be defeated in Jesus' name. I refuse to allow the promises to escape me as, as some have in the Old Testament and New. I refuse to allow any certain uh, uh, act Activity of demonic warfare we are called and are more than conquerors in the Lord Jesus Christ we are the head and not the tail we are first and not last I need a shout and an amen out there from someone in Jesus precious name so there is a time of going around the enemy and then there is a time where you and I face the enemy and overcome him now let's ask ourselves this question as we move into King Hezekiah and what to do with spiritual warfare. Just some small history in the background prompting this question. Are you a victim or are you a victor? Are you a victim or are you a victor? Now we live in an hour in a culture in a time where now seemingly and possibly Everyone is a victim somewhere, aren't we? We are a victim because of skin color. We are a victim because uh, I was born in this family. I've pastored over 30 years and I can tell you many of the reasons or uh, causes that Christians have shared with me why they have been defeated and why they, in essence, are a victim. Their skin color their family history, what they were born into, uh, the calamity of family dysfunction is why I am what I am. Thus, this is why I am a victim of economic uh, disadvantages. This is where I was born. This is why I can't win. This is why I can't get out. I 
Uh, I'm a victim because I didn't have any education. Beloved, I'm thinking of so many people in my mind right now. It's far away in, uh, in India, uh, in Bangkok, uh, in, in, in so many places, Mexico, Central America, South America with the disadvantages. And, and, and so uh, I, 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 I am a victim uh, because of gender inequalities. I am a, a victim uh, because of society's biases uh, and, and the list. This goes on and on and on. Now, don't send me hate mail, okay? I haven't read through the last batch yet fully. Uh, but what I'm sharing with you, that all of these reasons King Hezekiah could have used and could have became a victim in the world that he was living in. And I want to make sure that you, Christian, do not succumb to the spirit of victim. And as a Christian, you are called to be a victor. You're not a victim because of your skin color. I don't care if you're black, white, red, or brown. Beloved, Hezekiah had brown skin. He was a Jewish man and by skin color should have claimed victimization why he could not be a victor or even God's champion. But he didn't allow that. He knew that regardless of his skin color, regardless of pedigree, regardless of education, lack therein, regardless of family dysfunction, here we go, his father, King Ahaz, a king in Judah that preceded him. Listen to his resume. I'll read it to you. Second Chronicles 28, 1 through 4. Surely this could have been a reason why Hezekiah could have fallen and succumbed to a spirit of victim rather than victor. Ahaz, King Ahaz, was 20 years old when he began to reign as king over Judah, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. But he did not do that which was right in the sight of the Lord, like David his father. For watch, he walked in the ways, uh, for he walked in the wicked ways of the kings of Israel, and he made molten images of small g, gods of Balaam. Moreover, he burnt incense. In the valley of the uh, son of uh, Hinnom, which was the valley where they offered up children and burned them. He burned his own children in fire after the abominations of heathen. This is Hezekiah's family system, his father. Uh, in whom the Lord had cast out before Israel. He sacrificed also uh, uh, and burned incense in high places and on hills and under every green tree. What am I saying to you? King Hezekiah did not succumb even though his fa he had no father power, listen, and no modeling in his life. I do not want to hear of uh, children, of men and women using family dysfunctions and, and no father power. Did you know, beloved? But in this nation, there is more babies being uh, born through unwed mothers than there is of wedded mothers. Did you know that? Right now, there is more children being born that are unwed, non-married women having children than women that are, are married. And so if we continue on this uh, pattern and, uh, and realizing that God is so big and powerful, regardless of the, uh, of the dysfunction uh, and the lack of modeling, God can bring you and call you to be a victor regardless of the family system, regardless of all of the uh, supposedly reasons why I can't be victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. His dad was this one here. And the Bible says that God wouldn't even bury him in the scepter, uh, the sepulchers of the kings. He was so wicked. And so uh, Hezekiah had to make a choice not to succumb to victimization. Why? He couldn't be a victor. Listen again. If you are a Christian and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, the Bible declares that the victor lives inside of you. And when you succumb to victimization, I am a victim because of this reason, this reason, in this reason I break that off in the name of Jesus Christ regardless of skin color go to India and you'll see the seven layers of caste system and I can give you example after example of men of different colors of different pedigrees of tribes tongues and nations <coughs> God has raised up because they know and choose not to allow the the call for a victim 
to be their summary. To be their summary. And so we see here that regardless uh, of the modeling, God can turn your life around. God can begin to cause you to be a victor, and that's exactly what Hezekiah did. Now realize that Hezekiah, it went like this, just so you have some history on this side. Just let me move here just for a moment so we can have an understanding Again, of, of this Bible, it started out with one king, King Saul. And you remember the people wanted a king like the other nations, and God gave them King Saul, and he was not a good king. Then it went uh, right after that, a short time span. Now listen, a short time span by, the, uh, by a, a, a young boy by the name of Ishbosheth. Done a great message on him. Then it went to David, and then it went to Solomon. So draw a line under those four kings. Now here's what took place. So I want you to have an understanding of biblical history here while again we're in the neighborhood. Now under Solomon's son Rehoboam, he raised taxes so high he was a young king and he took counsel with those that had no wisdom. What took place was there was a rebellion and the kingdom of Israel with 12 tribes. Now listen to this. I'm going to quiz you after this. Um, the Bible says that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. Abraham was called a Hebrew. And so oftentimes Jesus would encounter men and women, Pharisees, that would point back to their lineage and they, were, they will say, I am a child of Abraham. They're touching in on the very origin of God calling this man Abraham uh, and Sarah out of the Ur of Chaldees. And they became known, uh, your Bible speaks of them as Hebrews. From Abraham came Isaac and then Jacob. Jacob had sons, 12 sons, and they became tribes. 12 tribes. Now, uh, Jacob's name, watch, was changed to Israel. They became known as Israelites. Okay, I'm going to quiz you on this. Hebrews. If you're a Hebrew, uh, like the Pharisees, they were touching in that their lineage goes all the way back to Abraham. Israelites came from the 12 sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. God changed his name. Israel means prince with God. He had 12 sons, 12 tribes. They were known as Israelites. Now what happened here under Solomon's son? Solomon passed away. Rehoboam, a young king, lacking wisdom, lacking godly counsel, raised taxes so high there was a rebellion in the nation of Jerusalem. Ten tribes revolted and went with another man by the name of uh, Jeroboam and they went towards Samaria, another territory. Three tribes, well really two, Levi wasn't considered a tribe, stayed in Jerusalem. Listen now, it was Judah, Benjamin, Levi, which wasn't considered a tribe. They were the priestly tribes and weren't given a region. So just think in your mind's eye now. Twelve tribes, ten went to Samaria, and they became known as the Northern Territory or Israel. The two tribes, really, three, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, they stayed in Jerusalem, which is known as Judah. Watch, and this is where the name Jews come from. It came from Judah, which was one of the major tribes of Israel, but now they were considered from then on southern, the southern kingdom or Judah had three major tribes, Benjamin. So Jews came from Judah. That's the term. Israelites, I'm an Israelite. They're saying we've come from the ten tribes and that's our lineage. Hebrews goes all the way back to uh, Abraham. Now, this one here, King Hezekiah, was the 13th king on the lineage of Judah coming down. Matter of fact, Jesus came from this tribe of Judah and he was the 13th king, okay, of 20, around 700 B.C. 
On the other side, there were 19 kings of Israel, mostly evil. Okay, I say all of that and I come back to show you now right here. Are you still with me out there? Watch now in terms of how King Hezekiah began the process of, uh, of, of moving into this capacity uh, to begin to push back uh, the attacks of King Sennacherib. I want you to look at 2 Chronicles, if you can. We read it. If not, I'll read it to you. Uh, in verse 2 of 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 2. Why was Hezekiah a victor and not a victim? Here is a list of reasons, uh, and then we'll close on our teaching uh, today and come back next time together and give you the actual tools. But I want you to see why uh, that King Hezekiah did not succumb to a victim mentality but a victor mentality in verse 2. Watch this now. Because it's something if you want to move out of becoming a victim and truly be a victor, we are going to emulate God's principles and God's word. Second Chronicles 29.2, Hezekiah became king, watch, when he was 25 years old and he reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. Watch now, and his mother's name was Ab 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 Abiah, the daughter of Zechariah. Here we go. Principle number one, to become a victor and not a victim. He did that which was right in the sight of his neighbor. Doesn't say that, does it? He did that which was right in the sight of his employee. He did that which was right in the sight of his best friend. He did that which was right in the sight of whomever he was having company with. Doesn't say that, does it? You want to be a victim? You want to continue that path and have all of these reasons why? I declare to you that God calls you a victor. The victor is living inside of you. And through his power and his word and obedience to it, you and I can become a, an overcomer uh, in all areas of our life. The Bible says he did that which was right in the sight of his Lord. Did you hear that, beloved? Let me ask you this question. Let me ask you this question right here. Are you God conscious or man conscious? Hezekiah was a victor. He came out of a fathering structure, a family structure that was, that was uh, so uh, terrible and uh, could have been destructive. And yet he didn't lean that way. He knew God in him. He could become victorious and became one of the greatest kings in the lineage of Judah uh, uh, that is in your Bible today. But he did what was right in the sight of God. He was God conscious and not man conscious. Now think about your life. Okay, you go to work. How much uh, uh, power is in the influence of your, uh, of your peers? Do you now, when they're, when they're uh, making jokes about this and that and, and, and sex talk about the woman and about what they saw and what they're going to do, and, and now Christian, are you... Uh, he did what was right in the sight of God. He wasn't man conscious. He wasn't what I call, listen, a chameleon Christian. Have you, seen, have you seen chameleons, how they can change colors in the environment that they're in? I mean, it's staggering to watch. They'll go up on a tree, and all of a sudden they become green, you know? And, and then they'll move over into the rock areas, and they, they turn colors. Whatever environment that they are in, they are able to change colors, and they are man-conscious and not God-conscious. You'll never be victorious in your Christian life, in your life fully by by being man conscious and not God conscious. And God wants you and I to carry his banner, carry his life, carry his heart, regardless if you're in the companies of presidents, queens, and kings. You are in a higher place than them. You are the servant of the Most High God, and you are an ambassador for him, and you represent him. Shouldn't matter who is in your, in your pool of influence. You are God conscious in your life changing colors and depending on their surroundings depending on their friends employees uh, decisions dreams business uh, dealings I I uh, had a conversation with this uh, NFL player I won't mention his name and he uh, was in uh, a, a battle for the number two position on the uh, on the team uh, and both 
the, the, the other uh, positioned NFL football player, both of them claimed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the time came for the coach to declare who actually was second on the uh, depth chart and who was third. Uh, this one over here uh, was uh, declared to be second on the depth chart. And this one, also proclaimed Christ, was third. This one over here began to attack this one here who also declared he was a man of Christian faith. You see, beloved, this should not be when those deep issues begin to penetrate deep into the character, soul of who we are. We should not change colors because a decision, a choice, movement in any areas of our life affecting the colors of who we are as a Christian of who we are. It should not matter who you are around. Are you afraid of losing your job because you're not, you're not uh, going out and, and, and drinking and carrying on with the, uh, the owner of the business? Do you have to m change colors for him because you're afraid to lose your job? Who gave you that job? It's God who gives you the job. It's God who opens the doors. It's God who shuts the doors. And once you and I begin to understand that and commit to it, then you are going to be a victor and not a victim in the name of Jesus Christ notice what it says in verse 2 he did according watch now with everything that his father David had done now David wasn't his father he was talking about watch now he found point number two to become a victor he found somewhere in his uh, capacity to have a spiritual model in his life. It wasn't his dad. It wasn't uh, anyone. He goes, I have found David and I'm doing everything I have seen my father David do. He found a spiritual model, watch, to emulate. I remember the churches we had planted and going into some and my daughter's going, you know, Dad, yeah, I hear you, you know, yak, yak, yak. And, uh, and so I would pray, Lord, bring a, a spiritual model for them that they can follow someone within or a few years above them. And, and I'm going to tell you the truth. It was hard for them to find. One of them even said to me, Dad, there's really nobody. I thought it was this, this one here. But look, she's out bedding down this and she's going to sleep with this and doing that. And I said, okay, you just keep your eyes on the Lord. And, and God will bring a, a, a someone for you to emulate uh, at, at some time. But until then, you just keep looking at Jesus Christ, learning of him. He found a godly model to emulate uh, uh, who was spiritual. Let me ask you, do you have a spiritual model in your life? Do you have someone? Yes, we got the Bible. Yeah, but the Word became flesh. I'm so thankful for some of the spiritual fathers, David Ravenhill, mostly where I can watch and see and actually boots on the ground how he's doing this. Do you have someone? Who is it? I would like to have you write it down for me and send it to me. <laughs> okay, number three. Am I boring you out there? Is it, uh, okay, let me, let me, uh, to become a victor and not a victim. It says here in verse three, watch. In the first year of King Hezekiah's reign, and in the first month, he opened the doors of the house that his father had shut uh, and repaired them. Watch this. Look, here it is, key number three for becoming a victor and not a victim. Look of at his priorities. First month, first year. This is what he was going to do. Do you, do you just, I just hear it, uh, declaring off the pages of priority. First month, uh, you know, even they, uh, the, the, you know, a new president comes on the first hundred days, you know. What's the priorities, okay? What are your priorities? His priorities were this. In the first month of the first year, he was going to open the doors that had been closed by his father, and he was going to repair them. What are your priorities in your Christian life? What are they? So you follow me around, okay, and then you'll see what priorities I have, and I'll follow you around, and we'll see what priorities uh, you have, and we'll just lay it all out there and uh, begin to ask God to uh, bring forth priorities. The Bible declares that Jesus uh, mentioned seven firsts in his Bible. We did a manual, a whole section of teaching, 16, 17, 20 hours on the seven firsts, and these were of priorities. What's your priorities? 
Is your husband a priority? Is your wife a priority? Those are healthy priorities. They're, they're not first. They're not first. Watch. He opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. John 10, uh, verse 9, Jesus said, watch now, I am the door. Okay. He opened the doors. In other words, it says here, I am the door. And those that come in by me will be saved. And you can go out and come in and find green pastures. Did you know that one of the priorities of Hezekiah was that he opened the doors. He declared Christ. He said, as it were, Jesus is the door. And so I want to make sure that those that are watching, maybe you haven't received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is, now watch this, He is the door. Jesus says, I am the door. And if you come in to me, you shall be saved. Thereby you'll be able to come in and out. And I'll lead you in green pastures, you see. Jesus is that door. There is no other. It's not Muhammad. It's not Buddha, it's not Hare Krishna, it's not any, any other uh, uh, individual, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad, those of you that have opened your life up to the door, Jesus Christ, okay? He said, I'm repairing the doors, okay, Revelation 3, 7, watch this. Jesus said, I'll open doors, watch now, I'll open doors no man can close, and I'll close doors no man can open. Now watch this, please listen to me. There are some listening or watching and will, and you have been reaching out to headhunters, to uh, 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 people, relatives, uh, acquaintances, and you are asking for doors to open. Can you open this door up for me for a job, for finance, for movement, for promotion, for transfer? And you've been wanting and you need it, and you've been endeavoring to find someone to open a door for you. Again, one of the priorities of King Hezekiah was that he opened the doors and repaired them. Listen to me, Jesus is the only door. And he can close doors that no man can open. I'm going to underline that and I'm going to pray that when you possibly become uh, um, so needing of something to be opened that you realize that Jesus Christ is the door. He opens doors and he closes doors that no man can open. Listen, he will allow, depends on the season and the time, for no one that you have a relationship with, uh, no headhunter, nobody in your sphere of living life and you're reaching out and you're clawing and you're begging, he'll keep those doors shut where you'll come all the way back and you will learn that Jesus is the door. He and he alone will open the door and he and he alone will close the door. Oh, well, preachers, that mean I can't reach out? Do you do all you want to do? But if it's that season where he's weaning, you off of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, siphoning of glory that belongs to him. He'll shut those doors. You couldn't pry them open if you said, I'll work for free. I'll come there and do this for nothing. He'll slam that door shut and the guy says, I don't want you. I don't need you. On and on and on until you and I come to such an understanding. Lord, forgive me. I have ran around chasing my tail and I've devoted all of this time and energy by trying to network and using LinkedIn. And, uh, and beloved, you and I need to be linked into the door, Jesus Christ. He is the one that will open doors and close doors. He is the do uh, door and Hezekiah had priorities in his life. What are your priorities in your life? It should be. Jesus said, seek ye, Matthew 6, 33. Seek ye first uh, the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these other things shall be added unto you. You can go through all seven of these priorities in your life. I'm going to quickly hurry uh, here. It says here, uh, the next uh, principle, he brought the priests and the Levites, verse 4, and gathered them into the public square on the east and verse 5 he said to them watch now listen to me Levites priests consecrate yourselves now 
And consecrate the house of the Lord of your fathers and carry the uncleanness out of the holy place. We're underlining the fact, are you a victim or a victor? And these are reasons why God chose Hezekiah and elevated him where through him defeated the largest world power and army at that time known to mankind. And here is the principle was the understanding of consecration of the priests. You spiritually are a priest and a king. 1 Peter 2.5 1 Peter 2, 9, Revelation chapter 1, verse uh, 9. You and I are kings and priests. He said, listen to me, Levites, consecrate yourself. What's that mean? It actually means in the Hebrew, listen, to remove dross from gold and silver, to purify by heat and by trials. It is my free will uh, that begins to be invoked and to be uh, and taking out of the uh, uh, and carry the uncleanness out of the holy place. So what is he saying? He's saying, look, there is a uh, a part for you and I to play. Oh, it's by grace. Yeah, it's by grace. It enables you and I to say, I'm not going to go to bed with Sally anymore. That is sins and I'm not going to do it anymore. Consecrate yourselves. Take the uncleanness out of the temple. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He's actually asking us to evaluate, is there any sins in your life and mine? He said, now listen to me, Levites. Consecrate yourselves now and consecrate your temple, God's house, and remove all of the uncleanness. Allow the dry to come out of that gold and out of that silver carry it out of your life all bitterness all hatred all racism everything in there almost finished right here in verse uh, 6 and 7 he began to share why the nation of Judah was in the state they were in for a father's trespass they did which was evil in the eyes of God they forsook him they turned their faces from the habitation of God and they turned their backs. They shut the doors, the opening of Christ of the porch. Watch, they put out the lamps. Psalms 119, 105, the word of God is a lamp unto my feet. They, they quelled the word of God. They have not burned incense, verse 7. Psalms 141, 2, may my prayers be as incense unto you. They quit praying. They quit offering burnt offerings in the holy place unto God of Israel. Basically, burnt offerings, Exodus 12, was a life given totally to them, to the Lord. He went on and on and on. And so he says here in verse 11, My sons, be not negligent. Watch now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him, to serve Him, that you should minister unto Him and burn incense. So he says here, in terms of closing, why he was a victor and not a victim, he said, you've been chosen. I'm going to let that sink in to your spirit. You've been chosen. Don't care what skin color. Don't care where you came from. God doesn't care. He's no respecter of persons. Again, 40 authors coming from herdsmen, poor backgrounds, orphans. Uh, 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 um, the, the, everything's in there. But you've been chosen. Serving. You feel that? You have been chosen by God. Secondly, he said, you're going to stand before God without fear. Stand before Him. Stand before Him. I don't know if any of you are basketball players. This scar is actually what happened when I uh, tried to go in and face some young lions. I went up for a rebound, and uh, uh, I was an old lion, and some young lions went up for a rebound, and one of the elbows came down and uh, smashed my face pretty good and opened me up pretty good. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and you're going to stand before him and serve him. Uh, and, and it reminds me of uh, Steph Curry. He's a basketball player and he's uh, one of the best in the world today. And he plays for the Golden State Warriors, um, which are playing for the NBA title. Now, watch this. I'm talking about... Uh, uh, standing before him, I'm, I'm talking about God conscious, and uh, they were interviewing him and, and why their team lost the first game and the playoffs, and he went on and shared a bunch of reasons why, and he said, we had a team meeting, and it was, watch what he said, it was a come to Jesus meeting, and the reporter said, uh, no, he's on national, international news everywhere in the world, and the reporter said, well, what do you mean by come to Jesus 
meaning. He said, well, we all came to a conclusion that there needed to become change. Something has to change if we're going to win this NBA title. It was a come to Jesus moment. Now, that wasn't so much important to me, uh, the terminology I've heard unsaved people. I have heard reported that uh, Steph Curry is a Christian. I know his mother, uh, uh, regardless of what's taken place in her life, at least uh, her testimony is one of a, of a Christian. And so I see uh, that aspect in uh, Steph Curry. The reporter said this. Now think about it. There's millions upon millions watching and listening. The reporter said, have you, have you had a come to Jesus moment in your life? Wow. Right there, talking about the NBA, talking about millions of fans over the world and how the team needed to have a come to Jesus moment and make a change. Uh, we're talking about this whole aspect of chameleon Christians and, the, and everything else within this. And the reporter said to him, have you had a come to Jesus time in your life? Wow, that came right out of the blue, didn't it? Now think about what you would have done in that uh, massive hall of reporters and all of that in there. I would assume there's not a lot of Christian men and women. And he says, and he did not hesitate. He said, absolutely I have. I have had a come to Jesus moment and he is the center of my life. I can't do anything without Jesus Christ. Wow! Isn't that amazing? I do believe this, that God is going to raise up voices in all of the sectors of life that you and I live in, and the, he's going to give them a voice, not for the ungodly and not for ungodly uh, uh, declarations and movements, but true men and women to declare his glory and his goodness that are going to be influential in moving people out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. What would you have said what would you say when you're out with your employees when you have to go out to the dinner with such and such how do you act and what do you say and how do you carry yourself yes I have had a come to Jesus moment he is the center of my life I can't live without him in it you'll see whenever he scores a basket he'll point up again I don't know his day-to-day -day living but there certainly is seemingly fruit from his life now, I'm going to stop in respect to uh, this first presentation uh, uh, as far as uh, uh, of moving on when under attack, what to do our next time together. We'll go through exactly what Hezekiah did, but I wanted you to have some background and some understanding uh, within his own life. I think we'll wait on communion and do that uh, um, next time we are uh, together um, but uh, communion is one of the greatest uh, weapons of spiritual warfare I didn't know if you knew that uh, but communion is one of the greatest weapons of spiritual warfare you know I want to do it but I'm afraid I'd kill you in the communion okay <laughs> okay so let's go ahead and pray together Father, thank you for your living word. We choose not to disdain uh, the Old Testament, O oh God, that all Scripture is God-breathed. And it is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly equipped. We do know that you have declared all these things that have happened in the past have happened uh, for, uh, as examples and types for our encouragement on whom the ends of the ages has come. And do we pray uh, even now, uh, Lord, that you would not allow us to uh, succumb to uh, victimization and having reasons why possibly even some, uh, some could say are valid, but you have called us to be a victor and to overcome and to rise above all of the challenges of each and every one of our lives. I pray uh, that we could emulate one of your godly kings, and that we truly uh, can be God conscious and not man conscious. That we would be men and women filled with priorities. We would be men and women that understand Jesus truly is the door. And that you could open up doors and close doors that no man could open. We pray collectively today in the name of Jesus Christ. That we understand there is a time that you will call us to face our enemy 
and not take us around. May you equip us to be fearless and filled with courage like you told Joshua. Be not afraid, but go and take the promised land I've given you. I thank you, we bless you, and we honor you. In the name above all names, Jesus Christ, amen. God bless you. I pray that you would remember those uh, uh, within the region of uh, Oaxaca uh, and our base camp that got uh, pretty much uh, hit and beat up uh, quite a bit. Anything you can do to help, we would certainly be honored and grateful. We love you and we miss you in Jesus' name. Amen.